The next part of our program will be led by Daniela Demir, a postdoctoral research fellow, who will be chatting to Professor Siyinka, as well as Tabo Jijana and Sindeswa Busuka Matesi. And I am going to hand this over to them. Thank you so much, um, Prof. Shoyinka, for this very enlightening um, second part of your keynote speech. Um, let me just quickly say uh, a few words about our two other um, guests before I um, begin with questions um, to all of you. Um, Sinusa Busuku Matese is um, a writer and uh, currently a PhD candidate at the University of Stellenbosch. Um, she has written um, one collection of uh, poems called Loud and Yellow Laughter. I believe Sindiswa is going to read from it at the end of this evening. Um, for Loud and Yellow Laughter, she was both um, shortlisted for the University of Johannesburg Prize last year, and this year she won the Ingrid Jonker Prize for it. Um, Tabo Jijana is a Johannesburg-based writer who hails from the Eastern Cape, and um, I'm very happy um, to have him here for his um, collection, Failing Maths and Other Crime, which should be an enticing title for everyone in the humanities. <laughs> um, he also won um, the Ingrid Jonker Prize um, that preceded this year, so it was in 2016. Welcome to all of you. I'm very excited and slightly nervous <laughs> to be leading this conversation. Um, so, perhaps my first question um, is going to um, the lady in this um, panel, uh, Cindy Swa. Um, we have heard a lot about um, Data Nelson Mandela, his role. Um, the talk was, of course, framed around him. But you, perhaps as it, you know, also um, from a, coming from a different generation, um, in your creative uh, writing, I mean, he's, it's, it, I'm, I'm not just referring to perhaps uh, Nelson Mandela, but other figures that loom large in, 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 in the history of, um, of struggle, more generally, um, anti-apartheid struggle. Do you think that the new generation of writers, of creative people, um, and you know, coming coming also from your own writing and from your own thinking, um, that that there is a there is a shift towards kind of uncovering other narratives that were that might have been kind of overshadowed by this prominent figure and other prominent figures. Um, thank you for that, and um, thank you, everybody. Um, so, it's a big question. When I think about my own writing, um, those sorts of prominent, prominent figures such as Madiba are um, not necessarily at the forefront of my thinking. But of course, his shadow is, stretches very long and wide over all of us here, um, and what he meant and what he continues to mean and how that's being dealt with and navigated. But um, if I think about um, the, the investment that is happening and has continued to happen, so I don't think it's necessarily anything new, but the investment in exploring narratives of those who did not disappear from the landscape, um, the political landscape, the creative landscape, but those who were disappeared um, deliberately. Um, there's an investment in that. Um, I think about certain narratives um, such as Krotoa Eva or Eva Krotoa. Uh, that's a, a narrative that hasn't been in circulation as prominently as it has been now, rather very contested. Um, when we think about Winnie, of course, um, Mum Winnie and her passing, always a subject of fascination, but um, now a, a stronger push to uncover what has been deliberately or um, 
you know, deliberately manipulated around who she is and what she represents and how she was made um, smaller because of those larger narratives. So there is a move, but I don't think that it's necessarily a move that is new. Um, I think that it's always been going on. Um, I think every generation considers itself to be uh, somehow uh, novel in its exploration of those things, but I don't, I think it would be um, naive to think that those conversations and the, that investment um, is some sort of new phenomenon. Thanks so much, Sintu, sir. Does any, any of the two others want to add something to Sintu, sir's uh, remark? Um, hello, everyone. Maybe uh, just to throw that question back to um, uh, Father Soyinka there, because I'm also aware um, I've always been interested, in fact, in, in, in some aspects of his work where you find that there is um, a fascination with these uh, larger-than-life figures. Um, I know that he has, for uh, I mean, one example, even had work around Shaka Zulu. Um, so I wonder even to you, Father, um, where does that fascination come from? And in, in a sense, bring back the question to Daniela, how do you really deal with the, the heavy burden of that shadow of all these individuals hovering over your work, over your own thoughts around um, Africa and how we make meaning of this continent? Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, you're asking for, in effect, creative uh, tricks of the trade. And I wish I, could, I wish I could drag some of the potential writers here to come and reveal their own secrets for me too. Uh, sometimes, let, let me respond more generally, sometimes you are just overwhelmed by the enormity of what you're trying to tackle. In other words, reality overtakes and, uh, uh, and really, shall we say, bullies uh, the material and the, and the inspiration because the the, the problematic is so, so vast. Mm -hmm. And at a time when uh, the, uh, the ideological mandate was an obsession for, especially in, during my generation, which was so obsessed with decolonization, it still is to some extent, yeah. but you cannot imagine the extent it was during that particular period, naturally. Hence he had that conference, uh, uh, Makarere. The, you, that. Yeah. And so you, ha you have to take a decision on your own. You just have to take a decision and, uh, oh good, there's one, excellent. Uh, and you hive away what I call the uh, encrustations of environment and limit yourself to a theme which you believe embodies, first of all, your own creative philosophy, your own life philosophy. You, you winnow it down to that and let everything take off from there. Because if you try to bring all the material buzzing in your head and which in fact impelled you to sit down at your laptop, you will be like the millipede who stopped to count his feet and never walked again. So you have to decide which leg to push forward. Yeah. It's a very complicated process, and to tell you the truth, I think that question is more easily answered in, uh, in the seminar condition, uh, as the truth. But generally, it's a question of being faithful to what inspired you, to what you can cope with as a writer, and then expand that to embrace what else fits neatly into it without trying to uh, pursue any exterior ideological line. Otherwise, as I said, it'd be like the millipede. Um, all right, my next question, I'm trying, I'm going to try and frame it around future and the past, the representations of future and past, because you've spoken a lot 
you, um, our father has spoken a lot about reimagining future. And um, again, sort of generally and specific to your own writing, you can always zoom in, right? Um, to all of you, actually, all three of you, I would ask, is it in, in terms of like creative imagination, in terms of writing, in terms of um, music, um, in terms of visual arts, um, very often, particularly, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a literary scholar, so I'm going to speak from what I know. Um, very often, in, in, particularly in South African writing, we encounter sort of the, almost a paralysis of imagining the future because we are caught in the past, but then the past is also the present because we must ask ourselves, obviously, you know, has anything changed or not? But are we, are we at a point where we can imagine, where we can see uh, new glimpses of reimagining futures, whether it is in, you know, form or content or exploring, um, you know, um, other worlds, parallel worlds, other than this one? Uh, he said, "Can can uh, in in terms of in terms of uh, writing in South Africa, there is a, uh, a propensity to focus more on the past. Uh, is it possible to explore other words, other words beyond uh, South Africa?" <laughs> well, let me uh, take the two together. I'm very glad they are extending the conversation beyond the literary arts. And it is very essential, uh, very pertinent to the sub-theme of, uh, of, uh, of this lecture. Because sometimes, um, to answer you directly, I happen to be, um, well, I collect works of art, especially uh, traditional works of art. And I never cease to marvel uh, and to uh, to tackle mentally the the core of the question which you just asked: Do you does the carver see the result in a In other words, is the carver uh, pursuing, quarrying, whether through stone or through wood? I'm talking about sculptures in particular. Uh, is, it, is it pursuing that image which you already sees? Or does it begin in a, almost in a kind of a, a mild state of possession, quarrying to some kind, some very vaguely, some very, some very vague destination as opposed to a concrete, you know, virtually if, if he had a camera in his head, whether he could have pictured it in advance, then started to work, and then you could judge, is this close to what that artist saw in the first place? And uh, especially those uh, carvings, traditional carvings, Yoruba carvings, in which you have a multi-dimensional interior series of objects from one single block of wood. I'm not talking now of a compact image, which is a sculpture which comes out of it, a single uh, surface sculpture. I'm talking about those very complex Multi, uh, uh, multi-dimensional interiority, almost like one of those uh, Russian dolls in which you take one piece out and you get another one inside, and so on and so forth, out of a single piece of wood. It's always a marvel to me when I contemplate those pieces. And I think that also is partially true in terms of uh, literature. The question whether you've composed it all in the, in the mind, or you, something you heard, and you start playing variations on what you heard, or let's say a dialogue, a chance dialogue. This Harold Pinter used to express his way of uh, composing in this direction that maybe he just heard a sound, a word, a syllable, and then he imagines what on earth created that, that single moment detached from all other reality, and then he imposes uh, weaves his own uh, tapestry around that single thread 
you know, which has inspired them. Uh, well, this will be, in my own case, I have a feeling that um, I, I employ all methods and uh, depending on which work we're talking about. But if I'm writing a word around a particular social situation, then it's clearer. I can manufacture characters uh, to propel my vision of what should have been, or what should be, uh, my corrective vision to an unacceptable facet of humanity. It can go in all directions, but I pursue that particular goal and uh, utilize whichever medium seems best for it, whether um, a poem, verses, a satirical play. Uh, fortunately, I also work in the theater, which means that I can even readjust when, it, when we get to the stage and uh, you know, play variations and so on, unlike uh, certain other forms of art. So I think very often is a subject that dictates both form and methodology of approaching the creation of that uh, result, uh, depending on um, uh, also cultures. <laughs> so I don't, I don't really have a, a big, lengthy answer in terms of um, the idea of reimagining futures. I know that within my own writing and a lot of writing going on currently in South Africa um, that I'm, I'm engaging with, there is a, a, an interesting um, attention being paid to futurity, um, speculative fiction m most specifically. Um, and I'm working on that as well. There is always the, um, the, the old argument that says, you know, to, to talk about speculative fiction or to talk about those sorts of imagined futures or the reimagining of those futures is to uh, somehow ignore the present condition and that is what deserves most attention. And, you know, those arguments can go back and forth um, and both have their merits and their flaws. But um, in terms of reimagining the future, uh, like many authors that came before me, the figure of the child um, becomes really important. And as we were listening to the keynote, I was really interested in the role of the child, the wandering child, the traveling child, um, and that quest, um, and the idea of never, never, never land. Um, and those are conversations that um, that are really interesting, and and what the child represents in terms of futurity, and um, but then you know even when we talk about the child, we've got to be specific. What does the black child represent um, when we talk about futurity versus um, you know a different a child of a different race? What does the girl child represent? But um, yeah, in terms of reimagining the future, those sorts of conversations have always, in my own writing, um, been narrated and explored through the figure of the child, um, as complicated as that figure is. Um, thanks so much, Cindy. Um, my last question. So, if we are thinking, you mentioned, Cindy, so you mentioned movement and the figure of the child. And I think that is so important because in your keynote, uh, Prof, you, uh, you mentioned movement and you took us from the tiny village in Italy to, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to many countries on the continent and then uh, also to the Middle East. Um, so I'm wondering, in, in contrast sort of to what you are thinking through, um, have uh, is is writing, and and I'm again like coming from the local, and then hopefully expanding. Um, is 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 our writing in in South Africa, uh, and and perhaps in in other countries on the continent, is it already as concerned with the movement, with kind of leaving boundaries behind, and. C can we already 
sort of cross borders, um, whether it is you know, it, borders of the imagination or actual borders and boundaries, um, or are we sort of stuck in the local, which is kind of a hindrance to arrive at Mandeland? I'm very glad that we're actually uh, talking about uh, children and also and their creativity, their powers of imagination, which should never be underestimated. Uh, L let me give you the, um, an example of, uh, first of all, I agree about the, uh, the sense of nurturing and encouraging that sense of borderlessness which a child brings into the world, obviously. Uh, it's that sense of a limitless world, that virtual non-existence of uh, prejudicial differentiation, uh, which is then inserted into the child as a result of wrongful conduct by adults and even deliberate indoctrination, I mean, South Africa is one obvious example in which the children, when they were children, all the narratives one sees that the children, the black child relates to the white, uh, just like another entity and vice versa, until of course they're told, you know, protect your class, protect your difference, and then the, the mal, malformation process begins. But basically, the, uh, uh, and, and that should be, for me, that period should be prolonged as long as possible. Uh, the, in other words, the combination of maturity with that basic innocence, guiltlessness, that ability to, ability to absorb no matter what phenomenon and retranslate it in their own in interior life. We, in Nigeria, we, uh, by accident, uh, I'm not uh, really a worker with children, in that sense, I'm not a professional, but in Nigeria, I was thrown into a situation where I actually created a program called The Vision of the Child. Uh, it came about uh, as a kind of development from uh, the uh, competition, uh, artistic you know, competition uh, during the festival. And something happened which um, encouraged me, just struck me, saying, wait a minute, why don't we see what, how children actually see the world? And uh, we began with schools, uh, we still are, you know, on schools, and I would give them a theme every uh, year. And it's amazing what they came up with, you know, playing variations around that theme. You can imagine one of the most prolific in terms of variety and, uh, and verve, in which I ask them to, to uh, illustrate, to interpret the theme of the thousand phases of corruption. You, you wanted to see what was produced. In, in fact, the, the crop of that year has been adopted by the uh, EFCC, we call it the FCC, economic uh, fraud, something, something, and they've been planning to tour it around the whole uh, country from three years back. It was a different theme last year, but this particular one, you could see that it spoke to them. Some of them even used uh, newspaper collage. Uh, they were shocked. It's amazing how much they notice about the malfeasance and of the adult world, really amazing. That exhibition uh, is the kind which can be used as border breaking, if you like. It'd be fascinating to see how the children here respond to that exposition which comes from Nigeria and vice versa, of course. And it doesn't have to be negative ones. I've also encouraged them to um, express themselves on positive uh, things, one in which the theme was the city of Lagos itself, the city of so many uh, thousand masks or something like that. And uh, they also came up with really remarkable 
penetration of society, unsuspected in uh, many levels. And from the painting, we then made it double, uh, double discipline, in which they were then to write a one-page essay on the image they had produced and why they chose that particular uh, kind of imagery, that kind of composition, even including colors. And then so we awarded a prize for the painting, we awarded a prize for the uh, composition, and then we awarded a prize for the, the combination and so on. And uh, they, they were thrilled and said, really, what were they, what were they, what were they got themselves into? So the, 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 the child also is uh, a, a useful agency, shall we say, of adult reformation. Cindy Sartavo, anything to add? No. Okay. Thank you so much um, for this wonderful conversation um, to all three of you. Um, I'm going to open it up to the floor now. I don't think we have too much time um, to ask a few questions, and then we're going to close with a few poems by Cindy Swa. Uh, we come from a high school. Um, uh, these are my children. Uh, African Leadership Academy. Uh, and our mission is to uh, produce 6,000 African leaders uh, in the next uh, 30 to 50 years. And we believe that uh, we have a glimpse of that promised land um, every so often from, from where we stand, um, at the top of that mountain, so to speak. And so as we create a context uh, within which we can collectively imagine an alternative future for our continent um, and co-create an African curriculum, what is the one thing um, that you think that we should not leave out uh, and that we should impress upon our young leaders for the two years that they are with us? There is uh, a story which I love citing very much. Uh, and it, for me, it's something which can trigger of child, Imagine a young imagination, and it covers all themes, all directions, whether politics, whether even ethos, whether initiative, but for me, mostly creativity. And it's a story of uh, Diaghilev and uh, Nijinsky, this uh, Russian impresario, dance impresario, Diaghilev, and this new young talent who was brought to him. Uh, Nijinsky, and as the budding uh, star, uh, the dancer of the Ball, Bolshoi Ballet, and he looked at him and he said, surprise me. And I think if we use the equivalent of that on every child in any situation, any undertaking, just very seriously and solemnly say, all right, here you are. Surprise me. I think we will be surprised. Yes. Right now, this talk has really changed my mind in a, in a little way. And I, wonder, I wanted to know how, what is the artist's role in moving towards an utopia? You're asking very difficult questions, you know. You realize that. <laughs> Do we have an artist here who can help me out here? I, it's a very, you delve into the mysteries of creativity, uh, which uh, very often I don't know how things happen many, many times. All right, let me um, again correct that. If I get on the stage yes, and I think now, with a bunch of people and we want to address a particular issue, in society. In other words, what I call my guerrilla theater. Within 30, 15 minutes, I guarantee you we would have had, we would have a, a sketch, at least a 10 minute or five minute sketch, to the point, succinctly, without collective uh, creativity. That's one way of doing it. 
unfortunately, most of the time, one has to create in total isolation. And that is where the difficulty lies in expressing how uh, we do it. Uh, I know of artists, for instance, who are very methodical, very tidy. Um, I knew one in the days of the typewriter, get up in the morning, make his breakfast, coffee especially, sit at the desk, insert a piece of paper, clean, of course, clean sheet into the typewriter, and he would refuse to get up until he had covered all the sheets which he had set aside. He just would refuse to do anything else. It didn't matter what. I know of another artist who never throws anything away, will not put down a word until he's 100% certain that that's the word that will go in there. So maybe there'll be just one line on that page, you know, for a full day's work. Then we used the example of the Kava earlier. There are other writers who just run, it's like a stream of consciousness. They just type it, it just keeps going out. Then the second stage is winnowing it down, just like that Kava hacking away at uh, a formless morass of words. He knows what they, what they mean, but he just turn everything, you know, through. But for me, the most uh, sensible artist, the most rational artist, the one who will probably never have a, a writer's block, um, is uh, the one who, the moment it appears that there's a difficulty, just leaves that work of art, it doesn't matter whether it's a painting, whether it just leaves it severely alone, goes to the nearest bar, <laughs> forgets all about it, and doesn't return until he feels that it was, it's blocked. I mean, the block has been unblocked, you know. For me, that is the kind of artist I really would like to be, because <laughs> I'm basically, I, I use the expression sometimes, I'm a closet glutton, for tranquility. I don't like work. Unfortunately, the opposite is what happens. I can't get away until I've finished what I'm doing. I resent every single moment of interruption. I'm not a very pleasant person. That's why I lock the door on myself, so I don't exhibit my bad manners outside when I'm working. But finally, be inspired. Allow yourself to be inspired. It doesn't matter what the theme is. Don't even begin, if you are not inspired, do something else. And you'll be astonished that inspiration will come, you know, when the subconscious, which has been gestating all along, despite your awareness, when it's ready now to come out, you know, in, in some form. Uh, I, I wanted to ask, uh a question as a floor member before exi before exigencies brought me to the stage uh, in your speech when you mentioned Padanone and how the people of Padanone were fascinated by the humanity of, of Nelson Mandela and the questions that followed up I am thinking um, how is it that they are in one hand this little European village on one hand they can empathize with the humanity of Mandela, they can uh, 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 feel compassion, they can validate his humanity, but they cannot in the same vein validate the humanity of the black laborer in the streets of Padanone. What accounts for this uh, discrepancy in terms of behavior of the same black body? Yeah, and it wasn't just in Padanone. I just used Padanone as an example because it's a very small village on the Austrian border. With, um, and uh, I, I encountered the same uh, feeling in Kazakhstan, as far away as Kazakhstan, uh, not so much in, um, in urban cities. I think they feel they're too sophisticated um, or too worldly wise, and they encounter phenomena all the time. But those little, this is where I really was impressed and really exhilarated to find tiny villages, not in on the African continent, but elsewhere, in Asia also, 
uh, not as much as in Italy, you know, like in this uh, particular village. And as I try to emphasize, these quest this questions were asked, this curiosity was a very deep curiosity, like um, a mythological figure, uh, which, however, they recognized as being human. You know, they were not uh, talking, they were not asking questions about some rare uh, being somewhere. No, they were asking questions about a human being. The nature of the question, the intensity, the personal uh, uh, tinge to the questions indicated that somehow or the other, the essence of this man had percolated that uh, deep. Now, of course, the contradiction which you mentioned is there. Uh, racism is still very strong in some of those areas. The migrant uh, issue is one which is not handled uh, uh, humanely, uh, in my view. And of course, that's also a two-ended uh, uh, two uh, uh, issue. Uh, the leadership, uh, where the migrants come from, uh, is culpable also in, uh, very often in failing to generate uh, uh, sufficient uh, fulfillment for even their trained manpower. So everybody migrates, all human beings want some kind of fulfillment. And up to today, they have not taken the issue of migration seriously. Uh, if, if, they, if the leadership was really concerned about Africans who end up in Libya in slave markets till today, there are slave markets. As it, it was all over the Nigerian media the other time. And for once, I was able to give a pass mark to the government because they actually sent planes to repatriate hundreds of some Nigerians who become stranded, who've been sold as slaves in the slave markets of Libya. And you still have them crossing the Sahara to um, Arab countries where they, with the, their slave labor is, but they're not exactly uh, slave. And uh, so it, it becomes so difficult for one to uh, go all out um, when one encounters the, um, the degradation of one's humanity in those areas when we know that the cause, the primary cause is here. That creates such a dilemma uh, very often. Um, you, to see a Nigerian doing a kind of uh, bojangles in the marketplace to earn a few uh, pennies is to, uh, yeah, so, so to as I did in, in, in fact, the same Italy, but a different town. I said, oh my God, um, what could I do? They just turn and walk in a different direction because I felt personally degraded. So it's a mixture all the time. Uh, that's why I use the, um, the that reimagining example of one day uh, when one tries to imagine African nations able to absorb their own manpower, talented manpower, ordinary manpower, to such an extent that we now have a reverse slave ships bringing everybody back to the continent. It is not impossible if there was a concerted effort. It, it just is achievable, I'm convinced, even within the next decade. Okay, um, thank you so much. Um, there is nothing uh, more beautiful than um, to be sent home by poetry after um, such wonderful words and beautiful thoughts and, and, and interesting thoughts that we've had. Um, I th think Prof Ngadi will make some closing remarks after this, but um, let us hear a few bites from Cindy Swa's, um poetry collection, Loud and Yellow Laughter. Um, thank you so much um, f for the opportunity to read. And it's a real honor to be on this panel with you. I will read just one poem, so not to hold everybody, called Stonewall for Mother. Maybe all he remembered was how you sat with him in the white rain on the stone wall where your whispers hung beneath his feet. 
Maybe it was your back, bare and curling into hands of half light, or the slow turn of your face against a graying sense of time. Maybe leftovers of laughter from garden strings your fingertips rained to hold that place taut before it all slipped away from you. He went away from you with a wink and a formal bow, barefoot with trousers rolled to the knees, dancing homeward on those big dilly-dally feet. And you still sit on a wall, calling for him not to grow old, shouting into fog. Will you remember me? Will you remember me? Will you? Um, all right. Uh, thank you so much from my side. It's been an honor and a pleasure to share this panel with you. Uh, Ndete Shoinka, it's been, it's been a wonderful day. Um, it's been a wonderful few hours. I'm going to hand over the mic to uh, Prof. Kumbuzomgati, who's going to make some closing remarks, and then we'll all be off. Thanks so much for coming through. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for coming to uh, this last uh, of the three days uh, that Professor Shoinka has been with us. Uh, I would like to, uh, first of all, thank uh, our distinguished visiting professor, Shoinka, uh, for having um, brought us uh, the words that he has uh, since, um, uh, since the 16th uh, when we had uh, a book launch. Um, uh, we, we launched a, a, an anthology of short stories called The Gods Who Send Us Gifts, uh, edited by um, our visiting professor, uh, Ivo Agemang Dua, um, and of course, uh, the stories in uh, the anthology um, inspire uh, a lot of what Professor Shoinka has been, has been talking about, uh, those travels within, uh, but also without uh, the mind. Uh, and I think this theme uh, inspires uh, us also to reflect on not just the continent, but also uh, um, how the continent has been, has been shaped by uh, the twin uh, uh, ethics that uh, uh, Professor Shoinka has spoken about and that is the ethic of freedom uh, and that of power and of course uh, these two have um, uh, existed in, in a tension. The freedom of the traveler has always had to be uh, curtailed, stopped, um, confused uh, and ultimately uh, frustrated by the nature of power uh, both within and, and, and without the continent and so I think that uh, uh, that dialectic of power and freedom uh, continues uh, uh, to, uh, to shape the ways in which uh, we travel within the continent and outside of it. And I think that those words uh, uh, should continue uh, to, uh, to exercise our imagination, but also to, uh, to inspire our, uh, our critiques, uh, our defenses of the continent. And I think that Professor Shoinka has been at the forefront uh, of uh, uh, defending the continent, but also uh, of making us honest about who we are. Uh, it has never been uh, just to, uh, you know, to extol the virtues uh, of who we are, but also to remind us that we have a responsibility uh, to ourselves, uh, we have a responsibility to our neighbors. In other words, the boundaries uh, that we inherited are not our boundaries, uh, uh, but that those boundaries have entered our consciousness and that we need to deal with uh, the psychical wounds that remain uh, uh, from, uh, from the history uh, that Africa uh, both suffered but also uh, uh, developed from. Um, and I think that for me, uh, that has been um, uh, the key uh, moment uh, of, of, uh, of my experience this uh, time around, uh, uh, remembering that Professor Shoinka started this journey uh, uh, here with us last year. I 
I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Daniela Demir for uh, looking after uh, the panel uh, discussion. But before that, uh, I will not forget to thank my colleague, Professor uh, Ronit Frankel, uh, who agreed uh, under pressure. Uh, this was the last day of term. As you know, um, it is always a, a, a very pressured uh, time uh, for uh, people in, in departments. Everything is due. So I'd like to thank my colleague, Professor Frankel, for agreeing to, uh, to um, direct this program. Uh, I would like to thank um, uh, Cindy Swa, the two writers, uh, uh, Cindy Swa Busugu Matisse, for agreeing to fly over from Cape Town, uh, give us her words of wisdom, but to read her poetry. <laughs> Uh, because that is always a, a for me a special moment when I, I listen to Cindy Sir uh, reading from uh, from uh, her uh, poetry. Tabo uh, Chijana, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for coming to uh, grace this occasion um, and uh, uh, for um, making uh, a contribution to it. And uh, I do hope that uh, this will not be the last time <laughs> that you come uh, to, uh, to be with us. Uh, but uh, most importantly, uh, let me thank uh, uh, the audience uh, who um, have come to, uh, to honor uh, Professor Shoyinka, uh, because I think that uh, he deserves all the honor uh, that we we give him, uh, and I think that when when he comes uh, to to these shores uh, again, uh, we'll give him uh, that honor. Thank you very much, and good evening. Thank you.